Hi, and welcome back to the next hour of the BA Marathon. Um, we have a, a, a very exciting session for you now, which is an overview of predictive analytics for practitioners presented by Dean Abbott, who's um, going to be joining us at the PASS BA conference. Um, so, Dean, if you just want to hit next on the slide, I just want to cover a couple of like, uh, hygiene issues. If you need any technical assistance during the session, just use your um, button on the right-hand side, the control, and just type your question in, and uh, either myself or one of my colleagues will, will be in touch to help you. Um, don't forget to maximize your screen so you get to see the full presentation and, and, and share everything that Dean has to, to offer you today. And also, if you have questions for Dean, we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the session um, for a short time. Please put your questions in there. We'll do our best to get through as many of them as is humanly possible. Um, I would just like to also take this time to thank our sponsors for this event, both Microsoft and Hortonworks. Um, it's, uh, uh, without them, obviously none of this is possible because um, all of this we're doing today is, is obviously uh, free, free to air content and um, we, we appreciate their um, commitment uh, to, to this event and to the community at large. So thank you to both Microsoft and Hortonworks. And now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce to you uh, Dean Abbott, who is the co-founder and chief data scientist of uh, Smarter Remarketer and the president of Abbott Analytics in San Diego. California. He's an internationally recognized um, expert in data mining and predictive analytics and has over two decades of experience using advanced data mining algorithms, data preparation techniques, and data visualization methods to solve real-world problems. Mr. Abbott is also the author of Applied Predictive Analytics and co-author of IBM SPSS Modeler Cookbook. And he is Oh, uh, just as a, a final piece, he's also on the advisory board and an instructor for UC Irvine Predictive Analytics Certificate Program and UC San Diego uh, Data Mining Certificate Program. So um, I'm thrilled that he is joining us and will be at the PASS BA conference uh, as both a pre-conference full day training seminar and delivering two sessions for us as well. We'll talk about those at the end. Um, if you want to reach out to Dean, you're more than welcome to over Twitter, LinkedIn, or um, at either of his websites at abbotanalytics.com. Ab um, as I said to you before, um, a big part of why we're doing this today is to help raise awareness to our uh, upcoming events, the PASS BA conference, which you can register today um, for and really get to understand the full life cycle of the analyst journey through data. Um, it's uh, going to be a fantastic event and I hope to see you there. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to now hand over to Dean and um, we'll, I'll catch up with you at the end of the hour. Thanks James for that very kind introduction and I, I'm actually thrilled also to be a part of the Past Business Analytics Conference. I, I'm glad that Predictive analytics has been included as part of the conference, as part of the portfolio of approaches. Uh, it doesn't replace things that organizations do already, especially if you're entrenched in uh, other ways of doing analytics, whether that's uh, more of a business intelligence approach or, uh, or other related approaches. But predictive analytics and its related fields like data mining, statistics, machine learning, and now uh, the, the new kid on the block really is data science. I've been around for, for a while. I've uh, been doing predictive analytics, predictive modeling for my entire career. So, and I'm one of the old guys, so I'm, I've been doing this for 27 plus years. And it used to be buried deep in the bowels of organizations. So all the guys or men or women who do the predictive modeling would be in the back room, uh, not seeing the, the light of day, just doing all their statistical analyses. But now it's come to the forefront which is really kind of fun, but I don't feel like I'm doing much differently than I used to do 20, 25 years ago. Not a lot has changed. And during the workshop that I'll be teaching at the conference and the sessions, I want to tie together some of those historical practices as well as some of the new things that have been going on in the field in the past five to 10 years. Uh, most uh, noteworthy of those are the big data approaches that, uh, that folks are starting to latch onto. So I'd like to walk through and uh, 
and describe in more detail the process of what predictive modelers do. And throughout this, uh, this particular webinar, I'm going to interlace the kind of the more boring but uh, functional aspects of what you do in predictive modeling with a case study or what uh, in other fields what people would call use cases. Uh, in, in predictive analytics and data mining, these are usually called case studies to describe one example. So I want to tie together these different steps of what we do with some specifics of uh, what we did in one particular instance. So what you see on the screen is the CRISP-DM process model. Now there are lots of ways people describe uh, what predictive modelers do or what data miners do. This is just one of them. So this is not the only way to do it. Uh, but and if you go to a conference where people describe predictive analytics or data mining or even data science, you'll see either this or something that looks very similar to this. Notice that this says uh, the cross-industry standard process model for data mining. Data mining and predictive analytics are very closely related. In many ways, they're synonymous. Uh, so there's not really a, a difference functionally between what we'll be doing uh, looking at this diagram and what predictive modelers do. But you'll see six blocks describing the process. So that's business understanding, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, and deployment. In my workshops at the conference and, and talks, I'll be focusing more on the inner parts of this, the data understanding, data prep, modeling, evaluation. If you want to understand more about the first and the last ones, business understanding and deployment, I'd strongly recommend going to the, the, the session by, by James Taylor talking about decision modeling where he uh, goes into a lot more detail on tying together business objectives and business processes with the analytical models and other analytics that you tie in with your organization. If you're interested in this uh, particular document, Chris DM, I don't have the URL here because it's a little convoluted. It's, uh, it's at some FTP server uh, at the IBM website. You can Google search it and find it there. So these are the six stages. I'm going to walk through these in, uh, in moderate level of detail to describe these six different steps and hopefully it will resonate with what you do within your organization. So first is business understanding, and I want to call out two aspects of the business understanding steps from a predictive modeler's perspective. And the first is defining the business objectives. Obviously, with any project we do that involves analytics, we have to know where we're going with it, you know, what, what we're trying to accomplish. And I strongly recommend, and this is what I do when I'm uh, doing consulting engagements, is defining the business objectives in the language of the business. So what are you trying to accomplish? So are you trying to uh, acquire new customers? Are you trying to prevent churn? Are you trying to upsell or cross-sell? Or is it a fraud kind of project where you're trying to identify suspicious or fraudulent uh, credit card transactions? All of these objectives in the language of the business help lay the groundwork for what the analytics process is going to try to do. And you'll notice at the far right, it says business success criteria, and without knowing what's good, we'll never know if we've achieved it. So we have to define what success is in the language of the business. Uh, and you'll see that clearly with uh, the example that I'll give in, in just a moment. The third row in this diagram, determined data mining or predictive modeling objectives, is just as critical though. And this is a translation of the business questions into an approach. So from the business perspective, we may be saying something like, we're trying to acquire new customers who are unfamiliar with our brand. The data mining objective may be something like, build a classification model, a decision tree, or logistic regression that tries to predict the one zero column in the data that describes whether this is a new acquisition or not. And then we have to define the success criteria, which hopefully will map to the business success criteria. And we'll talk a little bit about success criteria a little bit later near the end of the webinar. So the translation is critical. At the very beginning of any project, when the stakeholders are discussing what they're trying to accomplish, it is also critically important for the predictive modelers to be in the room so that these connections can be made clearly. So you don't have problems like I had about a year ago on a project where 
I was building clustering models, segmentation models, to try to describe new customer acquisition uh, groupings. And I thought I created a great model. I was really happy with it, only to find out that it was completely useless because it was way too complicated for what they could actually implement. So without those connections being made, uh, without the modeler being in the room, when the project is defined, uh, you can end up with great models that do completely useless things. So, for example, there was uh, an organization that was looking at trying to uh, identify uh, new responders to a campaign. And this was a, an affiliation kind of uh, campaign where they're mail creating a mailing uh, to try to advertise a new uh, video series. And they were looking to uh, uh, first mailing out a, a test mailing where they received an 11% response rate on a smaller set, and then they wanted to find a population that was a, a real key population that they could uh, replicate that test mailing on a bigger set of people, bigger set of customers, and they needed 13.5% response rate to be profitable. So the modeling objective here was develop the binary outcome model, the rank order, the current uh, members of the, uh, of the organization, and to try to achieve a 13.5% response rate. So they wanted to see how deeply could they go into the file and still get that 13.5 response rate. So this is classification. So if you're familiar at all with predictive modeling techniques and approaches, you know that this is the kind of uh, approach you'd want to do something like uh, a decision tree or logistic regression or a neural network or one of these classification modeling approaches. Okay, the next step in CRISDM is to take uh, the approach that you've defined and now we need to start looking at the data. And that means collecting the data, describing, exploring the data to see what you've got. And there are a couple of the steps in particular that are useful at this stage is to describe the data, does the data look the way we expect it to, and to verify the data to make sure that it's correct and clean. Uh, what are the, the very, uh, one of the big difficulties we all have with predictive modeling approaches is the data is almost never clean and uh, I don't care how much up and down, people swear that my data is clean. Every customer I've ever had says their data is clean. When you look at it, you find out that they're all lying. Now, that's a little unfair. They really weren't lying, but there's a difference between database cleanliness and predictive modeling cleanliness. Uh, database cleanliness often centers around uh, questions like this. Did we populate the data in a way that's consistent and that accurately characterizes the data we are supposed to collect. From a predictive modeling standpoint, we care about what the meaning of the data is. What are the meanings of the code? So even if somebody uh, filled in a cell in the, in the database table correctly, even if that acquisition code is correct, it may be that the, that acquisition code being characterized correctly is not useful for predictive modeling. Maybe every code is unique or maybe there are some codes which are captured correctly, but they were incorrect from the get-go. Somebody wrote down the wrong code, or there was a system glitch that populated these with the wrong code. So we need to know those things so that we can convey the proper understanding of the data to the algorithms. So in this particular example, the uh, business partner provided data, uh, 49 independent variables, and if you've taken a statistics course, you may remember that an independent variable is just one of the measured columns in the data, one of the measured attributes that we'll use to predict the outcome. We also have a dependent variable, which is the target variable we're trying to predict. So if we're trying to predict response or not response, that will be one column of the data. And we've got 49 other variables that we could use to predict that target variable. In addition, what we almost always find are the raw variables that we co collect are almost always not sufficient for good predictive models. We typically append the data or transform variables, derive new variables, so that we can enhance the data that makes it clearer or easier for the predictive modeling algorithms to work properly. So in this case, we enhance the database with demographic data, 
and that was 18 new variables. And we also created new features, new derived variables, ways to roll up or combine the measured variables, and we created 79 derived variables. So now we've got, what are 49, 79, plus 18, over 100 variables that we have as candidate inputs to build our predictive models. Then we need to clean these, uh, these, data, uh, these, these columns in the data. And this particular uh, use case I'm describing here, our case study, was using a tool called Insightful Miner, which now is uh, called Tibco Spotfire Miner. And you can see this is laid out like a block diagram. And each of these blocks that I'm not going to go through in, in any detail at all, but each of these describes a step we went through to fix data, to create new variables. So you'll see some things, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but on the right side there's a missing values. Filling in missing values with something that's reasonable is one of the common data preparation steps. Transforming variables, creating binary flags, one zero versions of categorical variables. Log transforming variables, sometimes we do that if the data is skewed. These are all uh, kind of typical things we do in predictive modeling that I'll describe more in the one day uh, seminar version of this. And then at the end of the day, we've got all of our records prepared for use in predictive modeling. At this point, just to do a little summary of where we're at with the data, we started with a bunch of variables, a bunch of input variables. We created new variables, and then we did some cleanup. Uh, interaction terms were added, and we ended up with 93 columns in the data. 76 of them were continuous, 13 were categorical. Uh, we had these four string variables, which are pure text variables, not just uh, uh, nominal or categorical columns and 21,557 rows in the data. Now, by this uh, case study was done several years ago. By today's standards, 21,000 records isn't a whole lot. But I want to, uh, just as one aside, uh, it's helpful to remember that the size of the data, big, big data, is only useful if the big data conv conveys more information than the small data conveys. Sometimes a few tens of thousands of records are perfectly fine to build stable, accurate models, and all the millions of additional records do is emphasize patterns that already exist in the data. So there's more to the story than just how much data we have. It's what is the information content in the data that's important in terms of building these good, stable, predictive models. Okay, now I'd like to go through a few other uh, uh, steps describing what we do when we're actually building the predictive models. So, so far, just to recap, we've defined the objectives. What are we trying to accomplish with, pred with predictive modeling? We've got to lay the landscape with the data. What are the sources of data? What does the data look like? Where are the data problems? Then we fix the data, create derived attributes. Uh, create new versions of variables, take those categorical variables, explode them out into dummy variables, transform them in ways that make them more appropriate to use for predictive modeling. Then we've got these four steps that we're describing in building the models. We select the modeling techniques we're going to use. We do some sampling and some test design. We use different algorithms to build models. And then we rank the models, score the models, assess the models to see if they're any good. So let's walk through a few of these steps in uh, more detail. We started with 21,557 records. What we usually do at this point in building predictive models is something that's referred to as sampling. And oftentimes the sampling is splitting the data randomly into training and testing sets. Now people call these data sets a variety of things. Sometimes they'll call them training and testing, sometimes training and validation, sometimes training and evaluation. The important thing isn't so much what they're called, it's what they do. And by splitting the data into these subsets, what we're trying to do is avoid the problem that occurs inevitably with everybody who builds predictive models, and that is a problem uh, called overfitting the data. And I want to create a little word picture for you 
uh, to get at the idea of overfitting. When we build predictive models, the, each algorithm has its own way of looking at the data. And when it looks at the data, it tries to identify patterns in the data in the training set that we're using to build the model from, and it tries to identify those patterns as accurately as it can. The more rope, as it were, we give to the algorithms, the more complex we let the algorithms get when they build the models, the more accurate they'll be on the modeling data. The problem is our data almost always has noise in it has uh, difficult patterns. There will be contradictions of the data where the exact same pattern can be associated with responders or not responders. Now, for those of you who have uh, worked in this space for a while, you know things like uh, if you send somebody an email and there's a click-through rate associated with, uh, with those who you send emails to, and maybe you'll get a 5% or 10% or, if you're really lucky, a 20% click-through rate on those emails. You could have identified a pool of people to mail to that you hoped would click through, and you have a pattern, a set of rules, or a set of characteristics that you're trying to identify in your customers before you send them the email. Some click through, some don't. But from the data's perspective, they look exactly the same. It's the exact same pattern, the exact same kind of history, the same demographics, and some click through and some don't. From the data standpoint, they're identical looking, which means there are contradictions in the data. Some people who look a certain way click through, and some don't. So the game of predictive modeling often centers around propensities. Who is more likely to click through? Can we identify those who are more likely to, to click through, even if we're wrong most of the time? If we have a lift or an increased propensity, uh, a lift of twofold or fivefold or tenfold more likely to click through, then that's considered a good model. But if the models get too specific, if they get too, too many terms, too many characteristics of the customers in the data, what happens is this. On the modeling data, you do exceedingly well. Maybe you get 80 or 90 percent correct on the modeling data. But when you apply it to new data, it does horribly because all you've done is memorize the patterns of those in the training set. So we'd like to have this second set, this validation set, or this test set, or this evaluation set as a guard against overfitting. And by doing that, we can identify when there are big differences between the accuracy in the training set and the accuracy on the validation set, or the test set. If there's a big difference between the two, we know that we've become too specific on the training and we need to ratchet back, make simpler the model itself. Ideally, we'll have a third set as well to provide a final assessment. Because if we build a model and a training set and assess it on the test set, and we say, oh, we've overfit. Let's fix it. So we retrain and retest. And then we retrain and retest. And we do this over and over again in the predictive modeling process. We may find that the test set is informing how we build the models. So it's good to have this third data set if you have enough data held aside in order to provide a final assessment that we just used at one time just to get a sense for how accurate the model will be. So that's the general principle with sampling. Uh, during the workshop, the one-day workshop, we'll go into more detail of different sampling techniques you can use in order to uh, handle other problems. We'll, we'll answer questions like how big of a data set do you need? in each of these train test validation. Do I need to stratify? Uh, what if I don't have a lot of data? What do I do? Uh, there are lots of sampling questions. So an entire course can be built just on sampling. And this is an example of the kinds of things the modeling algorithms might do. So this data set is not the data that I was using for this particular case study, but I thought it was uh, an interesting data set to use for illustration purposes. This is a data set. It's actually a, a Landsat set of images. Uh, and each of the images contained examples of, of different crop types, like alfalfa and corn and oats, clover, rye, soy, and wheat. The actual data is shown in the upper left. Here are five of the most popular classification algorithms that you'll see in the predictive modeling space, including algorithms like nearest neighbor, 
neural networks, naive bays, logistic regression, and decision trees. What I want to convey in this slide is that each of the algorithms does different things. They view the data differently, and they make different trade-offs in the models that are being built. So let me show you a couple examples of this uh, just in these uh, two in, in these uh, series of plots. The x-axis and y-axis in these plots are two inputs to the models. The colors are the different classes. And you'll notice in the actual data, in the lower left, there is no data. So what do the algorithms do in those regions where there is no data? Each of them have to do something. They all make an estimate of what's there. So look at the upper center nearest neighbor, what it does for trade-offs. The gold section and the red section are divided by a line. And that line is what nearest neighbor do. Nearest neighbor uses Euclidean distance to decide what's closest to the data points. And if you're trying to classify a new data point in that blank area, you try to find an example that it's seen before that's closest to where you're trying to evaluate. Contrast what nearest neighbor does to what the neural network does and what the decision tree do. They make the red class dominant. That red class, it's as if a line was drawn, a horizontal line was drawn, and everything below that line is considered alfalfa. So they make a different trade-off. Naive Bayes does something really funky, and frankly, I don't completely understand, but it does something really funky with this data, and it's got different classes identified in that unknown group. So it's important that, to understand that the algorithms view the data differently, and that's why it's a good idea to have a few different algorithms in your toolbox, because they'll tr make these trade-offs differently. But even where we see data, there are some uh, subtle differences between what the algorithms do. And you can look at the difference between the nearest neighbor trade-off between the Clover class and the alfalfa class and what the neural network does between the Clover class and the alfalfa class. They do different things in different parts of the data space. So at this point in the process, what we're doing with predictive modeling, and I usually like to use lots of algorithms, is we build, al we build models with the different algorithms. Maybe we build a half dozen or a dozen. We could even build hundreds of models with these different algorithms and identify which of the ones do the best. And what do we mean by best? Now, the classic measures of best for predictive modeling algorithms are things like uh, R squared for regression kinds of models, if you're trying to predict a continuous outcome. Or in this case, we're trying to predict a categorical outcome, whether someone responds to a test mailing or not, we may use something like overall classification accuracy. But I want to make sure that it's clear that algorithms do not generate decisions. Algorithms generate probabilities or confidences. They generate a number between 0 and 1. So there are other approaches to assessing models that take into account the rank ordering of what the algorithms predict will come out. So this is one of those kinds of approaches. It's called a rock curve, which is very closely related to things like lift charts and gains charts, which we'll all cover in that one-day workshop. The main point of the rock curve, and I'm not going to go through exactly what it means, but the diff th different models have different ways they make the trade-offs, and they'll do better at different parts of the space. The one thing I will say about a rock curve is the highest threshold on uh, the accuracy, on the probabilities at the bottom left, and the lowest at the bottom right. So this is the rank ordering from left to right of model scores and how we're interpreting those model scores. Model 2 does really well at the highest uh, probabilities, but Model 3 does well at the lower probabilities. So which model we choose, which one has the highest sensitivity, selects the uh, responders the best, depends on how deep we plan to go in the file. If we're going to mail to 70 or 80 percent of the population, Model 3 should be the winner. If we're going to only mail to the top 10 percent or 20 percent, Model 2 is the winner. Different models will have their day in the sun for different kinds of subsets of the data. 
So it's important that the model assessment method matches as closely as possible to the business objective so we know which one to pick, which model to pick as the best representative of the models we've, we've created. Okay, I'll uh, let you come up for air for just a moment. I know we've gone through a lot already. Step, the final step in the process is the deployment step. After we pick the model we want to use, and we've decided and characterized and reported on why it's a good model, things like which variables were influential, uh, what the accuracy we expect will be, and the like. And I'm going to go back just for one other moment. It's critical that this raw curve be built on the held out data, the validation data, not the training data for the same reason of overfit. We want a fair assessment of what the accuracy really is. Hey, if we build a nearest neighbor model, the accuracy of a nearest neighbor model on the training data is 100%. A nearest neighbor model is a lookup table. It's not what it does in the training data that matters. It's what it does in the held out data. So now we've picked the model that we plan to deploy, and we create our deployment plan, and we decide how we're going to monitor and maintain the model, how often we plan to update it, because every model we build will work for a while. The, uh, the selection of these, uh, of these customers or these uh, individuals with the 13, hopefully the 13.5 response rate, uh, we'll see how well we're doing it for how long. So for example, with this uh, particular uh, case study, they scored over 2 million prospects, and the actual rollout got a response rate of 13.67. Why did it match so closely? Because we picked the model and we picked the cut point for the model such that we would achieve, based upon our estimates from that model, that we'd achieve that 13.5 response rate. So we mailed to the depth, we cut off the model scores at that place where we expected the 13.5 response rate, and that's what we got. And as a result, they did uh, very well with this particular rollout. So once again, they go through the process, define the problem, understand the data, build new variables, clean up variables, build lots of models, assess the models, and when you deploy the model, decide how you're going to deploy the model and measure continually after the fact how well the model is doing so that you know that the model is behaving the way it was expected to behave. That is a quick run through of the whole process. Now, now that we've walked through uh, an example, now I want to back up to go to the very beginning and start this whole talk to, again from the very beginning, but uh, from a different perspective, more conceptually. What do we call what we do? Now, I mentioned at the very beginning in the intro that predictive modeling is related to data mining. Uh, data science is kind of the new the new way people describe this kind of uh, machine learning and analytical approach to solving business problems. So I took I went to Google Trends to show what these different descriptions look like over time. And uh, data science at the far left is the blue line. And data science in the 2005, 2007, 2009 was kind of flat. But you can see data science is really picking up at Google Trends now. Predictive analytics was kind of low for a while, and now it's starting to pick up as, as something that gets searched on, on uh, Google. Data mining has kind of fallen out of favor as the way people describe this kind of analysis. Other ways, data science and predictive analytics are the ways people describe it more. And what trend would be complete without putting big data on there? I mean, big data obviously dwarfs all these different things. So I also wanted to add this business dot 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 is business intelligence and business intelligence has been a stable way to describe this kind of analysis and reporting on data uh, for the better part of a decade. So what we do, whether we call it data science, data mining, predictive analytics, machine learning, this kind of this description of the way we approach this is what I've just described right now. They all do a similar kind of thing. How they do it could be different. So it's the simple way I'd like to describe what predict predictive analytics is, is this. It's data-driven analysis for usually, but not always, large data sets. 
by data driven I mean we use the data to drive discovering of good variables of good inputs we use data most often to drive how we validate the models we use the samples to decide whether or not models are good models or not we also use data to decide how the models are actually built some algorithms like decision trees are inductive algorithms the data is used to determine how many splits what the nature of the splits are and how deep to go for neural networks data is used to define the coefficients for logistic regression the data is used to define the coefficients and often when we do kind of a stepwise variable selection in these techniques it's also used to define which variables go into the models so these are all data driven approaches for predictive modeling for data mining data is king data is what is used to uh, determine all these ideas or another way I'd like to describe this is predictive analytics and data mining it's the process of discovering patterns automatically from the data so these input patterns are found automatically the combinations are found automatically think of it this way if classically statisticians are model driven there's a hypothesis of how they think the behavior should appear so you define which variables are going into your model and then you use the data to confirm the hypothesis or reject the hypothesis if you're trying to manually determine which variables are going into your model the main effect ones are fairly simple if we started with our 49 variables like we did in, in the case study I mentioned but what about two-way combinations if we start with 49 50 variables that's going to generate 1200 more than 1200 two-way combinations that's a lot of things for us to assess if we're looking at three-way combinations there are 19,000 plus three-way combinations there is nobody even the most dedicated nerd or geek in the room is not going to go through all 19,000 by hand we need a way to automatically discover interactions in the data that's what these algorithms these data mining approaches predictive modeling approaches do for us just to give you some ways that uh, predictive modelers and business intelligence professionals think a little bit differently about the data here's a list that's, that comes from my book that I wanted to use to uh, describe some of these things so the the more BI way of thinking about the data for email is what were the email open click through response rates historically so you look back at the data what happened what are those rates uh, which regions have the highest response rates which products have the highest response rates uh, how many repeat purchases were there describe the, the loyalty programs new subscriptions these kinds of things and I think you'll see with all these questions it's rolling up describing summarizing the historic data now I'll mention one pet peeve I have with predictive analytics and data mining oftentimes you'll hear this description of BI and what it does and the predictive modelers uh, if they're more bigoted shall we say will go about it and say something like this well the BI people they look at the historic patterns but we're looking at the future we're predicting the future we're trying to identify those new patterns what will happen well what I usually say to that is, is this we all use the same data we all have historical data and we do the same kinds of data preparation work with the data it's all the same the difference is is what we're trying to get out of the data and the approaches we use to gain that kind of insight so for predictive analytics rather than saying what were the historic email uh, open click-through and response rates we may say let's build a model to predict the likelihood for this kind of customer that the email will be open what is the likely we want to give, provide a score for every individual to give the likelihood that they'll open uh, if, if, they're, if they receive an email or what's the likelihood a customer will click through a link in the email you'll see in this list in the right what's typically uh, describing uh, the outcome of interest is something like a likelihood what's most likely what do we expect to happen so yes these are forward-looking but you could use those same historic measures in BI 
for uh, a model to predict the future as well. The biggest difference between these two columns is the approach that's used in order to generate them. And on the predictive analytics side, rather than using uh, summaries, one-dimensional, two-dimensional summaries, people use these machine learning algorithms, these statistical algorithms to generate that likelihood, to try to map those patterns to the outcome of interest. So I hope that's, uh, that's clear. Now, with all the new things happening in data science, I thought it might be helpful to describe some of the differences uh, between these two fields. This um, uh, picture on the left was just tweeted out. You can see the date, January 29, 2015. I just saw it tweeted out by Kirk Bourne, who is fantastic in the field. I, I love following his stuff. And when we look at the list on the left, all those bullets of what data science is all about, the thing that struck me is that everything or almost everything I see on the list is what I would say applies to data mining or predictive analytics. Statistics, data mining, uh, network analysis, uh, data intensive computing, all these kinds of things are things we do and think about. The differences, I think, are what I'm trying to summarize on the right side between predictive analytics and data science, and it's this. Data science centers on what I call a big data centricity. So we're usually in data science thinking about big data, which is why we use things like Hadoop, uh, NoSQL, uh, ways to handle the data because traditional data stores, transactional databases often struggle with handling the volume. Uh, and the speed that the data is coming in uh, for the big data. Another big difference between data science and predictive analytics or data mining is the program language centricity. In most data science programs, most descriptions of data science, you'll see a couple things. One of them is they use R or Python to build the models. And the second thing is they use Hadoop or MongoDB or some other technique like this or approach or data infrastructure to build the data. And those are the two big differences. Predictive analytics still is largely in the transactional world, not exclusively, but largely. And many predictive analytics professionals use uh, off-the-shelf, commercial off-the-shelf software to do their analyses or open source uh, software with the GUI. And in the uh, one-day workshop, I, I'll go through some of these different software tools that are most popular in the space. Some of these, I'll just mention a, f a few of them. I mean, there are open source tools uh, that uh, people use. The most popular of them are tools like NIME, KNIME, or RapidMiner. Uh, R, of course, is used very frequently for predictive analytics, uh, sometimes uh, as a standalone, uh, like with Revolution R, sometimes as an add-in to uh, one of these other tools. Almost every commercial or open source predictive analytics software tool has R extensions, so you can run your R code inside the, the tool. And then there are commercial tools, you know, the IBM SPSS modeler tool, or uh, SAS Enterprise Miner, or Dell's um, Statistica, or Prediction, or uh, with an X, or uh, lots of software systems, uh, SPM tool, uh, lots, lots of different tools, and I've forgotten, uh, I haven't mentioned many of them. There is a nice list of them you can find on the on uh, KD Nuggets to see what all the, the commercial tools out there are. What degree does it take? So this is a question I get asked uh, very frequently. Yeah, I'm interested in predictive modeling or data science. What should I do? So I looked at this list uh, of 10 influential people in data analytics and noticed a few things. One, in this particular list, seven had PhDs. But I argue you don't need a PhD to do good predictive modeling. There's masters and bachelors, and just so you know, I'm one of the non-PhDs. So you don't have to have an advanced degree to be a great practitioner. But the thing that I found especially interesting from this list is this. What degrees did they use? Now, often you see for predictive modelers or data scientists, you need a degree, and you'll even hear it this way, you need a degree in math or computer science or maybe specifically in machine learning. When we look at this list, you see there are some technical fields, but there's also social scientists, there's economists. Uh, physicists often make great predictive modelers. So there are lots of different 
areas that you could specialize in and still be a good predictive modeler. Now these arguably are mostly technical, but some of the best uh, predictive models I've known within organizations are more on the social science side or they're on the, uh, they're, they've never uh, gotten a degree in programming or data or uh, anything related to a deep technical field. Why is that? It's because they love data. And I usually describe this as the Freakonomics mindset. The Freakonomics mindset to me means that there are some people who look at data and they're curious, intellectually curious about the data and they're asking the questions like, I wonder why that decision tree split on that variable that I didn't expect to be in, that, in the model at all. I wonder why this chunk of customers are not being classified very well, yet they seem to be easy to understand from my standpoint. What in the data is not there? How can the data be fooling the algorithms? All these kinds of questions are representative of intellectual curiosity that's, uh, to me, one of the most important parts of uh, predictive modeling. So if you know the languages, if you know R and Python, that's great. If you don't, you can use one of the GUI-based tools to build your predictive models just fine. Uh, I'll mention one other thing since I'm at the end of my, uh, my, my deck here. Uh, the first place I would say to get started if you want to learn more about predictive modeling is, and if you don't have any money, download one of the open source tools and start building models. Start doing it. There's a level of expertise uh, that you gain from experience that's not represented in any book. And the reason why I describe it this way is that there are so many ways that data can, be, can fool you. It's hard to characterize them all in a book. So books describe the principles, books describe the algorithms, but they don't describe all the practices because there are so many ways that the data can fool you or mess you up. <laughs> uh, this is just a reminder of the, uh, the analyst journey for the, uh, the past BA conference. This is a repeat of the same um, slide deck, uh, the same slide we saw earlier. Uh, the conference is uh, filled with uh, workshops, with sessions to just unlock and help you understand how to uh, accomplish this kinds of, these kinds of analyses better from a practical standpoint. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's great. And thank you so much for that. Um, uh, Dean, it's been, a, I think, a fantastic in introductory session in terms of really getting to kind of uh, giving people a, a really great feel um, for what it means to be in the world of predictive analytics. Um, certainly make, gives people, I think, a bit more confidence to maybe take a first step rather than just being o overwhelmed by, if you like, the science of, of data science, if you like. Um, so I thought that was, that was a really important uh, take home, um, especially for pra practitioners. Um, uh, Antonio agrees, so he's uh, online, he says, to me, the best session of the day, congratulations and thank you. So there you go. Um, uh, I think that's a, that's a, that, that's a really nice uh, endorsement. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions, uh, not too many. Um, Raul wanted to know, um, um, uh, well, he, he thought that one of the uh, key phrases that we should be adding was uh, machine learning to the list of phrases that we were talking about. Um, but George wanted to wanted your view on sort of like a top five predictive analytical tools on the market, which is the ones that you like to use uh, maybe as a, as a way of thinking about it. And if you, by tools, if you mean software? Yeah, uh, I think so. I, I have to say uh, I am rather agnostic on software because okay. uh, there are many that are great for different kinds of organizations. There are some tools which are, are tied. What I usually uh, talk to people about when I'm making recommendations, and I've used most of the tools that are out there, and I've used most of them on consulting projects. So uh, I've, I've seen a lot of them. It, it's really more the style of the individuals within the organization. If you have uh, a team of statisticians and you're a SaaS shop, I mean, that would push you in one direction. If you've got uh, a, a team that's uh, less experienced, less statistical, you may want a tool that uh, doesn't get as deeply technical, but is uh, a tool that will guide you through processes. So there's some tools that provide 
um, a more of a step-by-step -step wizard driven interface so you don't have to know a lot of what's going on under the hood but you can still gain you know 80 percent of the value of predictive modeling so I'm I'm dodging the question on purpose no, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I think I'm, oh go ahead yeah, I was going to say one of the things I like to say is that we're, we're, I mean I, I used to do a lot of uh, stuff around uh, it, the internals of database engines and um, have, have have more recently moved into kind of scale out architectures and uh, and analytics generally. Um, and my one of the things that I like to talk to my students about is that breadth is the new black. So uh, <laughs> you can't you can't just pick that uh, that one tool. I mean you know data modelers for for years have just used RDBMS and it's kind of that's it and that you, you could use that pick that one tool and, and, and that would be your life and you knew that was your career and away you went um, and I think what is so exciting about uh, being a data professional right now is you know that there is such variety out there there's so many different strengths and weaknesses across various tools and algorithms that, that mean you do have to kind of have that much better broader you know the breadth play to your you know um, in terms of your understanding of, of, of products and software. You know, um, and if I could add one more thing to that, which is, is really nice, is when um, there's, there's a really nice survey out there of data mining tools. I mentioned KD Nuggets has uh, surveys as well, kdnuggets.com, run by Gregory Pietetsky Shapiro. It's a fantastic site. But Carl Rexer at rexeranalytics.com, R-E-X-E-R analytics.com, uh, does a uh, data mining survey every other year. It asks great questions of over, I think it's like 1,500 or so uh, data mining predictive analytics professionals. And one of the things he discovered when he's asking questions about software and tools is that most people use more than one tool. I think I forget what it was, like 2.3 or 2.5 or some a number of tools that uh, practitioners use. So it could be that there's some, there's some tools which are better at one kind of problem or better at building the models, another one better at interpreting, or maybe there's some algorithms which are better with one tool or another. Uh, so it's a good idea to keep, your, uh, keep multiple tools in your, in your toolbox. Yeah, I do, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I mean, that's, that's great advice. Um, um, Andy just uh, asked about whether or not this session is um, going to be posted. Absolutely, it is. All the sessions from the BA Marathon will be posted and be made available. Um, and you are more than welcome to um, uh, um, watch those at your leisure as soon as they as soon as they are available. So that's certainly um, going to be in there. Um, so um, I think. Um, that's all the questions that we really have in here at the moment um, in the window. If anyone has any last ones, I would hurry up and get them in. I, it, um, if you just want to click through the slide, I just uh, just want to bring to people's attention, those who have joined just for this session, that uh, PART is a, a, a not-for-profit organization, um, and as part of our mission is to kind of provide learning opportunities sort of 365 days of the year. Um, in particular for the business and analytics audience, we have a large number of uh, virtual chats and online meetings all recorded just like this one um, um, and definitely something that you should check out. So there's virtual chapters for um, business intelligence, business analytics, um, you name it, it's there, there's uh, cloud um, um, and I think that the, all of these things are very important um, opportunities for people to also connect and make uh, uh, networking associations um, because that's another a good opportunity for us to kind of grow our careers. Um, and uh, of obviously, for, from my point of view, I, I'm a, a member of the PASS board. I'd be very uh, remiss um, to say that I also hope to see you at our uh, PASS business analytics conference that is coming up in uh, April, April 20th to 22nd in Santa Clara, California, um, where you will obviously be able to see uh, Dean in person um, and meet him, attend his sessions. He has got uh, two, uh, two, two great 60-minute sessions and a full-day pre-con on a preview and introduction into this exciting world of predictive analytics. So.
would strongly encourage you uh, all to uh, go and have a look at the site. Go and see what 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 Dean has uh, in, uh, in 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 um, in his toolbox, um, and and ask him those questions face to face. Um, I'll just double check to see whether or not we have anybody else um, in here. I don't think so at the moment. So I think we're going to have to call it there. Thank you again, Dean, for your time, and thank you everybody who is online. There's so many of you. Um, um, just to say thank you for your time too, um, and I uh, hope you'll enjoy our next session, um, which is going to be coming up um, in the next couple of minutes. So I'll give you have a bit of extra time to hang over and get over onto the next session. Thanks very much, everyone.